the Cross Border Interviews, the show we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to sit down with Lucan Bidolf, Ontario Mayor Kathy Burghart Jensen. But before we do that, as always, I've got to ask you to do a favor for me. If you can, hit that subscribe button wherever you're streaming this right now so you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews and other episodes of Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown and Political Trenches Local Government at Work. This is where municipal matters matter most. Thank you so much. And now on to our interview with the mayor. Kathy, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about your community and talking about yourself. And I want to start with a generic question, but it's the basis of what the interview is all about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Kathy? Well, thank you very much, Chris, for having me um, on uh, this episode of your podcast. Um, it's always great to be talk to somebody about uh, my inspiration and my commitment to community. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, honestly, my sense of duty came from the family that I was raised in. Um, my mother and father always gave back to organizations uh, that they felt were important to them. Um, my mother was very involved in our church. And so from uh, we grew up in the United Church. So she was a proud president of the UCW. And um, we moved from Hamilton, Ontario to London, Ontario when, when I was quite young. And um, she found a volunteer base with um, a local hospital auxiliary. And uh, so we always saw our parents giving back. My father was extremely involved in community. Uh, and even served uh, served uh, our community. He was a member of parliament for London West in the early 80s. And um, then when he was defeated, uh, he went into the municipal uh, realm of, of politics. So um, I could go on and on about how he gave back to his community, but my parents raised myself and my siblings with the expectation that if you are a member of a community, an organization, uh, anything, then there is an expectation for you to give back and to serve. I, I usually ask the generic follow-up, but I kind of already know the answer since your father was an MP and a member of municipal politics, but I'm assuming politics was discussed at the dinner table growing up and you didn't just come out of it as a green um, uh, person coming into a municipal uh, field. So uh, was municipal politics brought up before your father entered into the municipal arena? Oh, absolutely. Um as a bit of background, before my father um, became a member of parliament, he was a broadcaster uh, and um, was very involved in broadcasting and independent broadcasting in Canada. He worked at CHCH in um, Hamilton um, and was provided incredible opportunity there when they became an independent station, came to London um, and worked for CFPL TV at the time. That's what it was. And so, yes, we politics was always discussed at the table. And in fact, um, my younger brother and I, uh, my mother passed away when we were quite young, but so my, my brother and I often share the stories of our breakfast time that we shared with my dad in that he would drill us on the news events of the day. And he would, um, you know, quiz us on, you know, what was happening in Ontario, who was the premier, um, who is the mayor of London, but not only that, what's happening in a neighboring municipality, what's happening in Alberta. Um, so current events, politics, how municipalities, how provinces, how countries are run was part of our daily discussions. So I, I've got to ask, how does someone who comes from a political family decide I'm going to follow in my father's footsteps and give back in the elected arena, give back in the municipal? Because I can tell you, I, I, I speak to people across this country and I hear my father was in it, so I wasn't doing it. My mom was in it, so I'm not doing it. I want to go in the different route because I saw the trials and tribulations of what they went through doing what they did. So you saw firsthand what your dad was going through as an MP, as a local elected official. What made you decide, you know what, 
I see it. I like it. I want to get involved. I want to get involved. <laughs> so, you know, you're absolutely right. But it's funny. You know, I grew up at a time. Politics was very different, you know, in the 70s, in the 80s. Uh, than it is now. And especially at those higher levels of government that we see, you know, we see the behavior at the House of Commons, we see that in, in Ontario, of course, we see the antics of Queen's Park. And I have to say um, that, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was, uh, there was a respect across party lines. And um, it was a very different decorum um, than I think that we see today. Um, and I have to say, when when my dad uh, entered municipal politics, it, it was really at that level where I saw the demand on his time, um, people calling um, him, um, where dinners were interrupted with phone calls, where that 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 sort of time, that sort of um, press for your personal time um, happened more at the municipal level than it did at, at the federal level, for sure. And um, certainly was able to see that sometimes it's not always nice what is what has said. Um, but to how I got involved, um, I think if, if, if my siblings and I, there was four of us, and I think if we were all here today, they would all share that um, where I am today, that probably out of the four of us, I, I would have been the one that was least thought that this is where I would end up. <laughs> um, but I, it was really an evolution. And I can honestly say that at no time in growing up in, in what I've done, did I say, you know, that's something that I want to do. As I say, a real evolution of the things that I have been involved in. So, you know, involved in my kids' home and school, involved in church youth groups, um, uh, involved with um, different community nonprofits, Canadian Cancer Society, organizing events for them in my community. Um, but honestly, I have to say, and I, uh, it is um, my work with with my minor hockey association. I was incredibly involved with our uh, minor hockey association in Lucan. Um, I started off as a parent rep and then I became a fundraising coordinator, tournament coordinator, and then I was president of our hockey association and, and had great opportunity to be involved in a number of community events, brought a number of things to the community beyond just traditional um, minor hockey games and that sort of thing. Um, and I often joke that um, it was, I, I was approached and thought, and was said, was asked to say, consider, you know, representing um, your municipality and, and serving at that level. And um, I often joke to say that I thought, you know, probably being elected official at the municipal level will be easier than being a look uh, than being my minor hockey um, president. And I have to say that um, for as much of the demand on my time that I've experienced, nobody as, as my role of deputy mayor or mayor, I've never been interrupted in a Thanksgiving dinner for a phone call, but as minor hockey president, I would take phone calls from parents during Thanksgiving, during Christmas holidays. Um, so I often joke that it, it, that it was an easier transition, but um, honestly, I think it is, uh, it, it is that tradition, that transition. And when you're involved in organizations in your community, you know, you, you, you do um, mingle with, with your council, with municipal staff, and you see how um, municipal policy um, is, is developed. And, you know, I think then there is a natural inclination to think, you know, um, I've, I've served here, but how can I take on a bigger role and um, actually, um, you know, make, an, make a difference uh, to our residents in a, in a broader way? So I, I try to do as little bit of research on people as possible because I want to learn from my guests from them instead of from newspaper articles and all that. But the one thing I try to find is when you first put your name forward. And for the love of me, Ontario election results municipally are the worst to try to navigate because there's not easily accessible. Yeah. Now, I know in 2014, you put your name for it for mayor. But did you had you put your name for it prior to 2014 in a councillor role? I just because I, I tried to find it. I yep. couldn't find it. 
And I and I agree. Um, statistics on on Ontario municipal elections are are, are difficult to find. Um, hopefully that will change since they're being taken over at the provincial level now by um, Elections Ontario. Anyways, I did run in 2010 and I ran for deputy mayor. Um, and I was successful. So I've been on council since 2010 and I ran for the deputy mayor position. Um, we have, we're a council of five and we have three councillors, a uh, deputy mayor and a uh, mayor. The deputy mayor and mayor run um, across the township and then we have three wards. Yeah. Um, so I ran um, for deputy mayor um, because I really, we had a, a representative um, that, that served my ward at the time that I was quite thrilled with. And I felt that my engagement with community, the things that I had done, that I would be successful at the deputy mayor level. And so, that that would fit my wheelhouse better. So I appreciate you, your answer there because now it gives me a better understanding of this next question. And that is, you've been in municipal politics for 13 years now. Uh, four years as deputy mayor, uh, almost well, four, eight, twelve. Let's say thir- uh, almost, uh, al- almost uh, ten years. Almost ten. At, yep. almost ten years as mayor. How much has municipal government changed in those twelve years on uh, as an elected official at the municipal uh, level? Oh, I would say that it has changed incredibly. Um, I have seen um, number one. I think the level of engagement um, that it takes for elected officials at the municipal level. It's no longer, um, it's not enough just to know um, the policies of your municipality. You really have to have an understanding of how the province works. Um, There is, and I've really seen that partnership um, or that I should say that relationship. That's a better word. I think in many ways we have partnerships with the um, province, no question, but it is a, it is a relationship um, between um, the municipal level and the provincial level. And um, it is so tightly bound. And I would say I have seen government that the, the need for government relations at the municipal level um, has definitely increased. Obviously, my community is a small community. We are now a, a community of about 5,000 people. Um, and I would say it has never, it, for communities our size, that that need for government relationships, uh, um, the that relationship building, not only getting to know our colleagues that represent us at Queen's Park, but to getting to know their staff, understanding the bureaucracy. I like I know uh, people I have like I have as an elected official, I have relationships now with people at municipal affairs. Um, I, I'm not li- letting that just happen at the staff level. Um, and as I say, I mean, obviously, that's always, I think, been a, a, a driver in larger urban centers, but for small rural communities, uh, that has definitely changed. I would say government relations. Um, it, it is a key. Uh, it is a key driver in how municipalities work, and how they get what they need um, today. And that's and that's gone from large urban centers to small urban centers to now rural Ontario. So that's a huge change. I think communication um, again from from I'm looking at it from a small uh, municipalities lens and. Like now, like we actually we ha- we have an employee on staff that is it, that that is a communications officer. Um, it, it, it's a shared position. She's also our economic development officer. But even that, you know, economic development was never considered um, an actual, um, you know, where you're actually going to pay somebody to be responsible for economic development in a community um, our size. You know, we had a, a economic development committee that was all volunteers and and that kind of drove things but at some point you're either in or you're out when you're trying to attract growth and investment for your community so that's been a huge change and as I say communication um, not only to 
our residents. Um, it's beyond just a, a newsletter, which we still send out. <laughs> we still do a monthly paper newsletter um, and uh, but it, social media, engagement with businesses, um, working with um, our upper tier government, uh, the county of Middlesex. Um, they're actually the primary service delivery when it comes to deliverer of economic development. But our economic development officer works hand in hand, you know, with the county to ensure that when they're bringing people in that are looking for for properties that, you know, Luke and Badolf is there. Um, so it's those those big things, um, I, I would say, has been the biggest change um, from how we conduct business, because now you're, you know, small municipalities are having to operate in the same way that our, our larger urban neighbors have been doing for forever. Has apathy changed a lot over the last 13 years? And I say that with respect because I hate yeah. painting a broad stroke here, but I have noticed, and I say that as someone who's an observer of municipal politics across Canada, that municipalities are struggling with engagement. Communications yeah. is great. Engagement is needed. How do you Absolutely. see yourself in your role as mayor, engaging with residents in sort of an apathetic uh, atmosphere where people don't really, I don't say care, but don't want to focus on municipal politics as much as I do, or you do, or your and, council colleagues do. Yeah. And you know what, like, honestly, Chris, like, I, I, I think that that is, um, I, I, I think that that's a statement for, <laughs> yeah, like municipalities everywhere. Um, and it, it and it is a struggle, and you and you try to bring people out. I mean, I've got um, November first, um, breakfast with the mayor. It's it's a return to you know the mayor's breakfast, state of you know the the state of the union address sort of thing. Um, so we try to do these events where we bring people out to remind them that you know when it comes to municipal government, we are the ones that are closest to 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 um to your lives um and i know it's cliche and and people say it all the time but you know you get up in the morning what's the first thing you do you flush the toilet and brush your teeth and if the toilet doesn't flush and the water doesn't come on um for you to brush your teeth who are you calling um but not calling your mpp i can tell you that you are not calling your mpp <laughs> that is for sure um and but it's beyond those things that people um have to understand um and you know all I all I say is, you know, every day I try to have a conversation with a resident um, where um, I'm reminding them of, you know, not only <laughs> the concerns that they have. I mean, it's so easy to point fingers at what is being done and what can't be what isn't being done but also on the positive. We've just gone through a major renovation and revitalization of our community center and arena. It is the, the place where, where I've, I've said from, from always that at some point, everybody in our community will walk through those doors. Everybody thinks your arena is only be, you know for your hockey players and, and your figure skating, um, but it's where celebrations of life happen. It's where weddings happen um, and, you know, Find those, I'm always trying to um, make sure that our residents have touchstones to the community. You know, that park that your child is swinging in the swing, that's because of the services we deliver. And, um, you know, that that's all I can do is try to continually engage and remind um, uh, residents that um, the community is, the, the community it is, not only because of the volunteers and the great work that our uh, service clubs do. I mean, I often say that municipal governments plan communities. It's your volunteers and service um, groups that, that build them. Um, but if it wasn't for our planning, if it wasn't for what we did, um, then you wouldn't have those parks. You wouldn't have the opportunity to engage and build the community that you want. You bring up a good segue, and I want to talk about the role of the council, because you are right. You are the closest to the people. The decisions you make impact the residents the day after you make them. In Ontario, in, in Toronto, when the decision is made at Queen's Park, it could take a month, could take two months, could take three weeks to trickle down to feel the effects of it. In Ottawa, it could be even longer. That means you have the biggest impact on your community. 
and you are in your community 24 seven. So the decisions you make good, bad, or ugly affect people the day after you make them. How much weight do you put on yourself to make sure you get it right? And I can imagine being in a small community like uh, Luke and Bidolf, it is hard because you go to the grocery store, you're going to have people ask you, why did you make that decision at council? It's affected me. It has changed the way I have to look at paying for groceries, looking at the ways that I can cut costs. How do you do that in a small community like yours? You know, it is tough. And I and I say and I think that it's gotten tougher. I mean, one of the great things um, about the pandemic um, was in order, for, you know, to continue the business of the day, we pivoted to virtual platform to continue our, our, our council meetings. And um, in many ways, um, that pivot to that platform um, has made us far more accessible. Um, and we've continued that, even though now, you know, we're back to meeting in person, we're in the council chambers, people can come and they can, they can come and they can sit in the gallery, but people don't do that. <laughs> but we're on YouTube and we have recordings now. I mean, larger municipalities, you know, their, their council meetings are on TV. They're covered by the media, not so much at the, at, at the smaller level. So when you, you know, you talk about the grocery store. Now I go to the grocery store and people actually do watch the council meetings and they do have a say, which it has been fascinating to me. Um, that they're taking the time now um, to watch the meetings, to learn more. So we're having a more engaged resident, but you're absolutely right is, you know, we're going to, you know, increase the fees for whatever. Um, and people will know that the day after. Um, and especially in these troubling times, uh, we have, it is incumbent upon myself and my colleagues to do our homework, to make sure that we are not taking staff reports just at, at and, and this may sound flippant, but at face value, um, because there's a lot of work that obviously goes into a staff report to come up with that recommendation. And, and you know, but quite often there's a thought that when a staff report comes, it's just taken and hands go up. Um, and that's it. But with the strains on our residents in, you know, it's one taxpayer and they're being pulled in so many different directions, it's incumbent upon us to ask the questions to make sure that we not only think about our residents and perhaps the economic, um, the economic situation that they're in and how our decisions will affect them. But we have to make sure that we are being responsible to our municipality. And that's, you know, that's what I always try with, to make sure when I, um, I'm defending my vote, defending my decision, is that I can say from, you know, my, my role is to make sure that I am setting our municipality up to be successful. And yes, that might mean that what I'm charging you is going to be the same as a, an, an extra coffee each day for, for a year. Um, and when you drill it down like that, of course, it does sound flippant. But, you know, by making those decisions and putting that cost across the uh, municipality and, you know, our households, then, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years from now, I've either built up a reserve that we can do this, that we continue to make sure that our roads are safe, that they are up to minimum maintenance standards, that they aren't falling apart, that I'm not going to have a bridge um, collapse, those sort of things. People need to know that when we make these decisions, it's not to provide, it's not to present more hardship um, to families, but it's to, to make sure that our municipality can function today and tomorrow. So it brings up a good question because you're there to look at the future of your community. You're there to look at the here and now, but you can't forget about the individual person as well. And individual issues are unique because people believe their issues are the most important issues to them. And I can imagine after 13 years, you understand that. How do you balance the individual need with the community needs? 
because you only have a certain amount of money at the end of the day to solve your issues in your community. And with a two tier system like the county of Middlesex and then the town, I can imagine it's even harder. Municipalities don't get an unlimited supply of money. You have to balance your budgets. Is no is is the word no the hardest word you have to tell people when people ask you we need this road fixed because my the this street is just horrible and I drive down it every day you know you don't have enough money so you have to say no or it's going to be fixed but maybe ten years from now if we have the money mm -hmm. yeah like no it's I mean it's all no is like the worst thing you can say to people <laughs> but it's also I mean. Like, it, it's like what you tell your children, right? You know, ask the question. What's the worst that can happen? You can say no. Yep. When you ask the question, even if the answer is no today, maybe that sparks the discussion as to, well, you know what? That might be in our asset management 10 years from now. But where is the community growing? Um, how is this happening? Maybe, actually, we need to look at that asset management plan. And maybe that's a discussion we're actually having in five years. Um, you know, so like those are for those broader, you know, um, questions when those, when residents come and, um, you know, ask for, you know, something in their neighborhood, that's when it gets difficult because, you know, to your point, um, you can't say yes to everybody. And just because you want it in your park or, on, you know, at the end of your driveway doesn't mean that that's the best for um the municipality as a whole and you know we do have limited budgets you know we there's not a lot of non-discretionary spending that municipalities have we have a limited source of income um and you know we have we have things that we have to pay for um so what's left over is often not a lot but when a resident as I, it's, it's back to that whole thing about thinking about well, how can this be done differently in the future or or putting something on the radar? So you come and you ask me for yeah, something in, in the park in your neighborhood. Well, you know, that's that's not happening. But it may be, you know, you get the stuff. OK, let's look at this for a year. And I know it frustrates people. Government's like the slowest way to do business. Things don't happen immediately. Um well, they happen but faster maybe. than the provincial and federal government. Let's be honest there. Municipalities, <laughs> it's three readings. It's not three meetings, <laughs> committee hearing, and then 12 other I committee know. hearings. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you know, you can bring an idea to council. And, okay, is there traction? Are you hearing this from elsewhere? Maybe the discussion that I have with you, Chris, today. And then in three weeks, I'm, I'm having coffee with somebody at another part of the municipality and they say something. And maybe this is a trend that we're hearing um, and it can be put on the radar. Um, and that is the other great thing about, you know, obviously municipal governments is that you have the ear of your politician. And if you can, you can see trends a lot faster. Um, you can, you can make these decisions uh, with, with, um, you know, for your government, you can make them faster. Often, as I say, your residents think they happen slow, but, um, you know, things change in municipalities quickly. Uh, and um, if you can get the ear of a local councillor um, and, keep repeating it over and over and over again. Um, I think eventually that's how you get change. I want to turn to the, the town as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion. Don't know why, but we get emails. <laughs> <laughs> so, mayor, in your opinion, as of the time of recording this, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing your community today? Infrastructure. Um, so. Well, in the need um, and money <laughs> and a lot. <laughs> <of stuff. laughs> um, we are in. A, we are fortunate to be a growing community, um, and uh, we have seen incredible growth over the last four or five years. Uh, the last. Uh, statistics that were released by Stats Canada. We are the seventh fastest growing community in the province of Ontario and the 21st fastest growing community in all of Canada. Um, and obviously that's a per capita basis since we still are a small uh, community. Um, and growth brings a lot of opportunity. 
Um, but uh, it also, you know, requires a lot of investment um, in infrastructure from uh, the municipality. So we have a major infrastructure a project in front of us in that in order to grow, uh, in order to build homes faster, as the province is directing us to do, um, and as the federal government is too. I mean, the, the, the federal government has a national campaign to build houses um, and is, is putting municipalities on notice that we have to build homes. In order to do that, we need to expand our uh, wastewater treatment plant. And that is not a small project. Um, and the pandemic and supply chain and all of those, you know, fun buzzwords that we've developed over the last few years of the pandemic um, have now made what started out as a $9 million project into a $22 million project. And how seriously, does, seriously, seriously. When we first started this, it was estimated that this project would be between nine and $11 million. And now um, we figure this project will be $22 million. Wow. And how does a small municipality do that of like 5,000 people when they've already paid for the system and growth is supposed to pay for growth. And we do have development charges, um, but those obviously um, only come at the time of building and working with developers as to how, how we're gonna front this. Um, there has always, there has been, um, you know, uh, programs in the past where projects have been a one third, one third, one third contribution. Those no longer exist. And quite often our higher levels of government aren't interested in funding growth related projects because there's that mantra that growth is supposed to pay for growth. Um, but I know when this comes to my council this year in 2024, when they actually have to pull the trigger, if there is not um, something that gives them security in saying we can actually pay for this, it's going to be hard for them to pull the trigger. And if we don't pull the trigger, then we don't grow. Uh, and so how do you put the cart before the horse then? How do you yeah. put the cart before the horse in this scenario? Because it is a double-edged sword. You need to grow. You need infrastructure to grow. Growth won't happen without infrastructure. Infrastructure wow. won't happen without growth. So municipalities like yours are stuck between a rock and a hard place trying to figure this out. So I'm going to ask the political question here, and I apologize, but you need to do it. How do you feel like you're going to be able to do it without talking about what's going to happen and when you're going to have to pull that trigger? You have to start having these conversations here and now, because once that decision comes up, it's going to be a hard pill to swallow no matter what, because it's 22 million today. I can only imagine what it's going to be in 2024 if the affordability crisis inflation still stays the way it is. Well, exactly. And I mean, that's the thing. We, we, we don't have that kind of money in our bank. Obviously, it's debentured. So now even just paying it back turns it into a much higher project. Um, but you are absolutely right, in my opinion, and this is yeah. my opinion, um, and it will have to go to council, but I, uh, we do not have a choice. Um, we have to do this. There is no question. We have, we have uh, lands that are designated for future residential. We have investors and developers in our community that want, want to grow, that want to continue to build. Um, and so we have to do this. And you know, it is, you know, up to me as the head of council, as the, you know, the leader, perceived leader of our community, um, to have those conversations with our residents, to ensure that I we work with our finance department to ensure that there is a clear understanding of, of that $22 million, what has to be put on the current taxpayer, rate payer, um, what is put on developers, and my other job is I am constantly lobbying the province of Ontario um, to get them to expand infrastructure programs. And I am not the only one, um, you know, this is, this is a, con we are not unique. This is a conversation that is happening across municipal, uh, across the province in municipalities. Um, we, as I say, municipalities have limited resources as to how they can raise funds. And if the province is not a player in these games, 
um, you know, then you are going to have municipalities that are going to be um, say full stop. And, um, you know, the province's mantra of building homes faster is not going to happen. You know, you bring up an interesting point about putting the cart before the horse. And, um, you know, we're seeing that with how the province has developed, um, you know, their lane um, and, you know, their directives and, and the wanting to build homes in that they said, this is the path that we're going down. They didn't have conversations with municipalities and they didn't construct, it didn't consider aging infrastructure across the province. Um, so, you know, it, these are difficult uh, conversations. I really do put my Pollyanna hat on. I, um, I do have faith that the province and the feds will come to the table uh, with, with programs because otherwise uh, Ontario will not be able to grow in the way that, that, we're, that we're being asked to. Do you have developers knocking on your door today? Like if Absolutely. I went to your, so people want to build in your community. We just went through an official plan process in um, that we had to, and a part of that was a municipal comprehensive review where we were expanding our boundaries, um, our growth boundaries. And um, there's a whole mathematical formula as to how, how large you can grow. And we could only grow by 137 acres. And we had applications for almost 700 acres to be uh, to grow by. So, um, you know, we still have developed our official plan will be um, will be appealed based on that because uh, we have developers that want to develop. And um, as I say, they want to get shovels in the ground, um, even with where we are um, as a country with with our interest rates and, and everything. Um, we've had developers that have been doing all their background work this year. Um, and I really do suspect in 2024 um, that uh, you will see shovels back in the ground in the off. Do you have NIMBYism alive and well in your community? Do people not want to see the community change? Because you're there to make the sure the city grows, make sure the town grows, make sure that things move forward. But there's people who move to your community have said, I want it to stay the same. I don't want it to change. How do you balance the needs of the people who want what they're what they have grown accustomed to with the understanding that if growth doesn't happen, people's taxes are going to have to go up thirty percent, ten percent over four years. Absolutely. I mean, and that's and that's. I mean, you know, you drill it down. I mean, that's the first thing you throw out. But um, are they about... willing to hear that though? <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't understand, <laughs> right? You know, and then you, but then, and that's the whole thing. And then you, you say, well, okay, but if if you don't raise the taxes, then you know this isn't happening. And you're looking at service deliveries, and you're looking at this, and you're looking at taking away, and then all of a sudden the lights go on. All these things that you've been come accustomed to are no longer going to be there. Um, but if, you know, it is growth is a balancing act, and it's it's you know. Um, those that are born and raised and have lived their whole life in this community and have always known that when they go to the grocery store, they're going to go, they're going to know everybody that is, you know, buying their milk and, and getting their loaves of bread and they can have these wonderful conversations and catch ups um, and that that's changing. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be a, there's always going to be a group that is going to say, we don't need to change. We can always be this way. But then there's there's been an excitement as we've been able to see the kind of businesses that we've been able to attract, the programming that we've been able to offer in our community center. We now have a medical center where, you know what? I can go get an ultrasound. I can go get an, an x-ray. These are these types of investments that are being made in our community. I don't need to drive to London. That's 20 minutes down Highway 4 anymore for those sort of things. Um, you know, now you're seeing small business come come to Lucan in a way where, you know, um, I, I have more options for the things that I can buy here. Um, and you know, for the, the people that are have chosen to move to Lucan and Lucan Vidolf, you know, you're absolutely right. They've come because it is a lifestyle. And, you know, they, you know, they may not want that to change. This is this is why I moved here, because of that. 
So what we have to do is ensure that we keep that flavor of the town that it is. So, you know, you're still going to have your community festivals. You're still, we still are investing in, in those um, things that are happening at the arena that are bringing people together. We still have our, our fun, you know, charity hockey games that, you know, between the hockey coaches and, um, the fire department so that you're always bringing community together, ensuring that we're having those um, fire department breakfasts. Um, and that's the thing it's keeping the, the, the spirit of community alive um, and making sure that people always feel connected to what's going on. And it is a balance, but we hope that, you know, we're, we're still able to do that. And then it doesn't matter if you live on Nicoline, which is part of a older, older subdivision that is much more established or over on Campanelli or over in one of our smaller urban areas in Granton or Clan Boy, that you feel that sense of community and belonging. So I want to turn to my last segment because I've realized what time it is and I am taking a lot more time than I expected, but that's the great thing about this conversation is they just fly by and you don't realize how long they've been. So I, I want to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart and it's tourism. I love tourism. I think that municipalities play a role in the tourism industry and I believe that municipalities do a need to do a better job promoting the hidden gems in their communities. Because I think as Canadians, we should be visiting our own backyard before we start going to visit sunny Cancun. Not saying in case sunny Cancun is bad. <laughs> I'm just saying I'd rather spend my economic dollars here in Canada. So as someone who is hopefully, knock on wood, going to be coming through a southwestern Ontario here uh, next spring, next, well, right before the AMO conference next year. Okay. Awesome. What, what are some of the hidden treasures hidden gems of your community and i'm gonna encompass a little bit larger i want to put i want you to put on your middlesex county hat on as well Absolutely. and talk about what are some of the hidden gems in your region that you want tourists to know about well i'm going to talk specifically about lucan we have an incredible history um it's a history that is uh, a town that was built on immigrants um for the most part uh and Irish immigrants. And if anybody is interested in... I was hoping you were going to talk about this. I was really hoping you were talking about this because I didn't want to be the one who brought it up. Well, so and you know, if I if I had been, if I was mayor in the 80s, I would likely not be talking about it. But to your point, tourism has become an economic driver in our history. We need to, small towns need to be telling histories and be part of that, you know, um, Canadian landscape. There's so many stories to be told. And, you know, as dark as Lucan's history is, um, you know, it is a story to be to, to to be told. And for those that are listening that may not be familiar, um, it is the story of the John Lee tragedy. And it was a family that um, for all intents and purposes uh, was lynched. Um, and uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, there are opinions on both sides, uh, but it was a divisive story for our community because for so many years, uh, we did have, and we still do have family members, not on the Donnelly side, uh, but on the town side, uh, ancestors that still live in, in the town, um, and um, tell the story of, you know, the, the war of families. And um, I often say, if we were in the United States, in small town Georgia, there would be neon signs um, on I-79 telling you to take off uh, and turn here and learn about this story. Um, but we're not, I mean, like Canadians, right? We're, we're humble, we don't tell our stories. That being said, uh, in the last 25, uh, 30 years, our community has come together and we have a museum. Uh, it is the Lucan Area Heritage Donnelly Museum. Museum. It's the old house, is it not? Um, there is an old homestead um, on the property. Um, okay. Our museum is on our main street um, okay. where where the uh, tragedy and murders happen, it is now a privately owned uh, uh, place. There is um, there is a, uh, wow. a sign um, that recognizes what happened there. 
Um, and uh, but we have a museum, and it, it it tells the story. So it does not it it not only tells the story of the Donleys, but it also tells the story of Wilberforce. We were part of the um, Underground Railroad, and we were a stop, um, and we were a settlement, and um, we did have um, mills. And we did have a um, black settlement for a time, uh, and so it tells that story, and of course, it then tells the history of everything else. So I will gladly take anybody through my museum, um, take you to the um, cemetery, and um, show you, take you along the route, um, but also show you, because I, 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 I think the other story is the Wilberforce story, and it is it is um, a story that has not often been told. Um, but in the last few years, um, we have definitely made efforts to to pay homage um, to. Um, those that came um, at the Underground Railway and celebrate what they offer to our community. So those are my Lucan stories. From a Middlesex standpoint, I mean, there's so many to share. We ha have an incredible agri-tourism business. We have small farms. Uh, we are, uh, obviously, agriculture is the number one driver in Lucan Bidolph and in Middlesex County. And we have seen um, industry grow from there. So we have farms uh, and farm gate operations that um, have really thrived. Uh, you know, since the pandemic, I would say, when that whole idea of, um, you know, tourism in your own backyard and discovering what is happening uh, in your community really did take off. And we've seen that continue. We have an incredibly, incredibly, incredible culinary tour where we have local restaurants that thrive on our local produce, that um, deliver menus that are based on not only produce, but obviously our um, beef um, industry and our, um, you know, all of the, the, that food industry. So I'm happy to, to share that. And we have, you know, small business, um, you know, you know, incredible makers and artists in our community that um, uh, obviously have um, businesses that thrive not only in their workshops at home, but on, you know, an online business that have made them accessible to so many um a broader audience. So I have lots to share across uh, Middlesex County. Uh, our small businesses and investments that have been made uh, locally, uh, in, in, internationally are something to be proud of. Um, what about yourself? Where do you go? Where do you go in the community, in the region that you can, or the county, sorry, to just let it all go, to decompress, to let yourself recenter yourself, refocus, because you know tomorrow morning is another day and you're going to be at more challenges, more opportunities, and more meetings that could be 30 minutes like on, on your October 17th <laughs> council <laughs> meeting or three hours like some meetings. <laughs> so where do yes, you go to just Yes, unfortunately, October 17th, 35 minutes, I mean. <laughs> I was impressed, I've got to say. <laughs> Yes, that's right. I'm such an efficient uh, media, media, a meeting um, chair. Um, honestly, where do I go? I go home. And I am incredibly fortunate to live where I live. I have a um, hobby farm. It's 35 acres. And fun fact, it is the highest point in Middlesex County. Um, my road is Observatory Drive. And uh, there is an observatory on my road that is managed by the University of Western Ontario, but that is where I go. I um, walk my road every single morning and I am grateful for the opportunity that I have. And, um, you know, that is where I can go. I can, I can scream there if I need to, if I am frustrated, if I um, am feeling incredibly down, I can cry, I can find solace, and um, I can be inspired. So that's that's where I go. I, I know it sounds cheesy, but I have a family. You're not the only, you're only, you're not the only counselor or mayor who said they're home, so uh, I could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my family supports me, and when I walk that road, um, it reminds me um, that as a municipally elected official, uh, that's really that's really what matters to the, the decisions I make. I'm affecting people's homes and not just my residents, but I'm affecting my home too. 
So I'm going to leave on the million dollar question. I think it's the most important question I ask a lot of municipal politicians because I know that they know the answer, but I like hearing the answer. And the question is, in your opinion, what makes Lucan Bidolf such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, again, it's going to sound cheesy, but it is the people. Um, it really is the people and the community. And um, when it is, and it is the love that they have for this community. As I say, we, our demographic has changed incredibly. You know, we are no longer a, a community where you know everybody. Um, we have people that have moved here, um, that have come from the GTHA, that have come from Northern Ontario. And there's a variety of reasons for why they've chosen to live here, but they have chosen to live here. They have, they don't have roots, but they have chosen to become part of this community. And you see that in the Lions Club in that, you know, it's not only Lions members that have, have lived here forever, but it's they've got members that have only lived here for two years. And people have an investment in Lucan, in Lucan Badolf, in Granton, in Clandeboy. They want to be part of the community and they want to make it better. Um, we have seen uh, events in our community that have, um, you know, ripped us at our core. We have we have seen despair and we have come together and we have had incredible joy. Uh, we were, you know, Craft Hockeyville in 2018. And when we came together to experience that, um, it, you know, it brought everybody together, old and new, you knew people you didn't, hugging, crying, um, and it just solidified. Uh, what community is, and I do see, I, I do see that each and every day, and um, it's all very well and fine for us to um, make policy, pass resolutions, and everything, but if you don't have people that are committed to making your community better, then it's all for nothing, and I am fortunate that that is what happens at my home, in my home. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, I can imagine as a local official, you don't hear this enough, but I want to say this as well. Thank you for serving your community. The days, the day-to-day -day challenges that municipal politicians have to deal with are, would, would, would crush a normal person, but you deal with some big issues and you do it for the sake of your community and you do it for the sake of the greater good so thank you so much for serving your community and thank you so much for being part of growing your community but also growing canada because you are the closest to the people you make the biggest impact and i don't think you get hear that enough and I, uh, as in ontario this week as we're recording this it is local government week yep. i i want to say thank you so much for serving so thank you well thank you very much chris i mean i it, it is an honor it's a privilege it's something that i i don't take lightly um, I am humbled by the experience and it really is because I love where I live and, um, you know, I love what I do. And, uh, for all the downs, there's, a cer <laughs> there's certainly a lot of ups. So I, I want to thank you again for this opportunity. Um, it's been great. Um, I mean, yeah, it, an hour has gone by. I, I can't believe it. I could probably talk to you for the next, you know, two, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page 
conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.